From May 4th onwards, we finally started practicing advanced maneuvers such as steep climbing turns, loops, spins, snap rolls, slow rolls, etc. The airspace above the field was divided into quarters A, B, C and D, and we performed these maneuvers within our assigned quarters at altitudes above 3,000 feet. However, for beginning pilots like us, these maneuvers were very unnerving. Seeing the ground above my head when inverted in a loop or spinning straight down towards the ground was completely disorienting. One day, about a month and a half into our flight training, the names of nine trainees who weren't making the grade were announced. Apparently both their flying skills and their classwork were not up to snuff. That evening at mealtime, Instructor Tanaka gave us some more sobering news. Just because your names aren't on the list doesn't mean you're in the clear, he said looking directly at each of us in turn. The difference between those nine and you guys was only five points. His message was unmistakable. If you guys want to make the cut, you would better take this training very seriously. We were shocked. None of us knew when or if we might be cut. Our sense of security was shattered. However, I was determined to succeed at all costs and vowed that starting the next day, I would do my absolute best in the air and in the classroom. Once or twice a week, we were given written exams on various subjects. A score of less than 65 points was a failure. This reality weighed heavily on all of us. Most of those in the classes ahead of us passed their tests and went on to become pilots. If they could do it, so could I. I will show them what I can do, I told myself. Finally, we moved on to high-altitude solo flight at an altitude of 9,000 feet. This was as high as the Type 3 trainer could fly, so we just climbed up to this altitude. Of course, the air was much thinner at this altitude, so there was less lift. We had to use full power just to maintain altitude. It was also much colder up there, so we had to keep an eye on our oil temperature. This first experience with high-altitude flight was quite a challenge for us all. Even if it was a comfortable 21 degrees Celsius on the ground, it would be just above freezing at 9,000 feet. And of course, we had to constantly check our position over the field so as to stay within our assigned airspace. However, the reality was that at this altitude, the field was often obscured by haze. This was just one more of the many challenges we first year students had to overcome. When the high altitude training was complete, it was time for our three month practical tests. Instructor Tanaka listed the items to be covered. Airwork maintains situational awareness at all times monitors the instruments, steep turns are coordinated, uses rudder properly during descending turns, slips, uses proper left-right corrections so as to descend towards the aiming point, formation flight, operates engine controls smoothly and appropriately, maintains correct position relative to the lead plane, uses same bank angle as the lead plane when turning, just before the test instructor Tanaka gave us some words of encouragement. Remember, don't tense up, just pretend you are on a regular training flight. Testing began on June 23rd. I passed the tasks on takeoffs and landings, formation flight and air work. In fact, I thought I flew pretty well, but fate is a cruel mistress. During the morning flight tests, our instructor was Ishikawa. But while we were taking our written tests in the afternoon, he was killed in an accident. What happened was this. The mechanics were changing an engine in one of the trainers to get it ready for the next day. After installing the new engine, one of the mechanics climbed into the rear seat and carried out a ground test. Lieutenant Ishikawa then got into the front seat to carry out a test flight. During the flight, near the town of Nakagawa, the plane clipped a high-voltage power line and crashed. Both of them were killed. A rescue unit was immediately formed, and many trainees jumped into trucks and headed to the crash site. This was the first airplane crash that any of us had ever seen and both the victims were well known to us. This was a terrible shock for all of us. In spite of this awful accident, we were expected to complete our tests as scheduled. A Buddhist altar was prepared in the hangar, and the bodies of the two men, along with the wreckage, were transported to the field. Everyone in the squadron lined up in front of the main gate to pay their respects as the bodies and personal effects of the two men were carried onto the base. I was badly shaken by this event and deeply saddened, Lined up with my squadron mates, I was overcome with emotion. I came to the conclusion that the best way to honour their sacrifice was to excel in my studies and become as good a pilot as possible. Enlarged photographs of instructor Ishikawa and the mechanic were placed on the altar.
I couldn't help thinking that it was only a few short hours ago that we were happily flying together. After that flight test, instructor Ishikawa wrote the following critique of my flying. Students' climbing turns and level turns are good, but when returning to straight and level flight student allows nose to rise. Use more forward stick. Student does not use enough rudder during stall turns. Needs to be more aggressive with rudders. Clasping my hands together, I offered up a silent prayer to instructor Ishikawa. Tears flowed from my eyes, but whether they were tears of sadness or regret I couldn't say. Goodbye, instructor Ishikawa, I thought. Don't worry, I will do my best to ensure that your death was not in vain. Goodbye, our primary training was completed on June 29th, but it was announced that another five trainees didn't make the cut. Filled with trepidation, I made my way to the bulletin board to see if my name was there. My heart was pounding, but thank goodness my name wasn't among the five. I felt really bad for the guys who didn't make it, but my main emotion was one of relief and exultation. Banzai, I said to myself. I made it, in fact. All three of us from Tanaka's class made it. So the first thing we did was go to his office to thank him. When we arrived, he greeted us in an unusually gregarious fashion. Well, nice to see that none of you are holding back tears, he said with a smile. On a more serious note, I would like you to view Ishikawa's death as a valuable flying lesson. Let it inspire you to always do your very best, Hai, we answered softly. Instructor Tanaka and I were both from Saitama, so he was a bit easier on me than on the others, and this caused a certain amount of envy. However, I knew I couldn't count on his goodwill forever too. As pilots, we now knew all too well how easily a moment of incaution could have fatal consequences. We accepted without regret the fact that we could die at any time and resolved to do our duty like men. The first blossom falls, our three months of primary training at an end. We again returned to our base at Kasumigara. For the next three months, beginning in July, we trained in the Type 93 Intermediate Trainer. Then, on July 7th, the Marco Polo Bridge incident, 21 took place on the Chinese mainland. War with China suddenly seemed inevitable. From this day on, the Navy brass decided that no more trainees would be cut. The Air Command figured out pretty quickly that the hundreds of trainees they had cut over the past few years would have a very negative effect on our fighting strength. The prevailing dogma that only the very best will make it was quickly abandoned in the face of the coming conflict. However, this belated change of policy affected much more than we trainees. It would have profound consequences for Japan's future. As the war ground on to its catastrophic end, the lack of trained pilots would prove crippling. I was now assigned to a carrier attack unit, which had been my goal all along. I successfully completed one month's training in the Type 94 carrier bomber, and on November 30th, 1938, I graduated from the 38th pilot trainee class. I had now logged 166 hours and 25 minutes of flight time. Along with ten of my fellow pilots, I was ordered to report to the Tachiyama Naval Air Group. Training started the next day. At Tachiyama, we were to undergo four months of specialised training as carrier bomber pilots. In spite of all the training we had already completed, until we had finished this special training, we would not be considered qualified pilots. Our training consisted of horizontal bombing, torpedo launching, instrument flying, night flying and formation flying. We also switched to another airplane, the Type 84 carrier bomber. This was a real torpedo plane that could carry an actual torpedo and attack enemy ships. After only two training flights with senior pilots in this plane, we trained with our fellow classmates. As primary students, our instructors had told us just how to use the controls at all times. Now, however, we were expected to figure all this out for ourselves. Of course, when we didn't understand something, we could always ask the more experienced pilots, but without constant study and effort on our part, it was impossible to improve as pilots. Our instructors repeatedly told us, if you want to become a good pilot, you must become accustomed to the airplane as quickly as possible. However, the real danger comes when you become overconfident, that usually happens at about 500 hours. That's when your chance of accidental death is greatest. We had this drummed into us. And as one of the youngest pilots, I decided that the best way to improve would be to simply take everything one step at a time. By December, full-scale war had broken out with China. 
The fighting that had started near Shanghai was now moving deeper inland. Attacks by our Navy planes were becoming more intense every day. Shanghai was occupied by Japanese troops and senior pilots from our group were being sent to frontline units there. Every time we saw a group of them take off, it only increased my desire to go also, but I knew that I still wasn't ready for combat. However, before long I had completed initial training in the Type 84 and moved on to instrument training. During the day it was easy to orient oneself by looking at the horizon, but at night or in clouds the pilot has to rely entirely on instruments. You cannot trust your senses and must give undivided attention to the turn and bank indicator, altimeter, airspeed indicator, rate of climb indicator and heading indicator. I found this training to be highly stressful. Twice a day, 20 minutes at a time, we went up in all weather until we became proficient in this arcane art. For we knew that until we had mastered instrument flying, we couldn't call ourselves real pilots. Training for night flying began in the half-light just after sunset and continued into full darkness. As our skills slowly evolved, we became accustomed to the night. When January 1st, 1938 rolled around, we were very disappointed to learn that our winter vacation had been cancelled due to the war. I had been looking forward to returning to my hometown and showing my mum and family the red dragonfly mark that now adorned the left sleeve of my uniform, the little badge that meant so much to me and that I had worked so hard to earn. But it was not to be, still we were able to celebrate on the base and we all enjoyed a nice three-day break from our daily routine. It was around this time that some trainees who had just completed their reconnaissance training joined our group. We now began training as three-man crews consisting of a pilot, navigator and radio man. Our training route consisted of legs flown between the airfields at Shimoda, Ishigashima, Oshima and Choshi. While flying over these fields at 3,000 feet, we measured the wind speed and direction, correcting for wind drift so as to fly in a straight line between fields. Most of this work fell to the navigator. My job was to simply fly the course. During this time, the radio man would be contacting the various fields and exchanging coded information. Of course, it was my job to keep the airplane right side up and flying steady while all this was going on. One day, as we were over flying the lighthouse at Sotobo, my navigator gave me a heading of 250 degrees for Shimoda Harbour, so I obediently turned to that heading. At the same time, my observer was watching the whitecaps and calculating the wind drift and giving me wind corrections. Upon reaching our turn point at Shimoda, we set course for Oshima and performed the same processes to determine an accurate course. When overflying Oshima, we were prohibited from flying near the volcano, for it emitted a constant stream of gas and ash. In spite of my efforts to steer clear of the area as we flew by, I could feel the wind pushing us towards the caldera. It gave me a sickening feeling that we might be swallowed up within it. The view we had, however, was simply spectacular. It was a view of nature's power afforded only to aviators, and we considered ourselves very fortunate to be able to enjoy it. After rounding the volcano, we again set course for the lighthouse at Sunasaki. At first, we were all rather unskilled at navigating, but as the days went by, we soon surprised even ourselves at our growing competence. On January 27th, we finally got down to the heart of the matter and began torpedo training. During our first flights, we didn't carry torpedoes and trained only on the launching procedure. This consisted of learning how to properly line up on a target at a height of 150 feet, and then practicing the release procedures at a distance of 300 yards. A target ship was anchored in Tatayama Harbor, and a buoy with a red flag was floating 300 yards from it, helping us to accurately judge the distance. To successfully launch a torpedo, the airplane must be stabilised and coordinated in straight and level flight. If the plane is banked even slightly to right or left, the torpedo will run off course. Our first two torpedo runs were done with senior pilots in the rear seats acting as instructors. We then spent the next week on our own until we had mastered the technique. It wasn't until February 19th that we began carrying dummy torpedoes. The purpose of this training was to accustom the trainees to carrying the heavy load. The warheads were filled with water to simulate the weight of an actual weapon, and the entire unit weighed 1,600 pounds. However, when released, they were designed to run on the surface of the water rather than below the surface. During my first flights with these heavy weapons, 
I was surprised at how drastically they changed the airplane's flying characteristics and worried about my ability to fly with all that extra weight. But when I saw the other guys doing it, I figured I could probably do it also. Be careful when turning when you've got those things strapped on, the senior pilots warned us. If you start daydreaming up there, the plane will stall out on you. On my first takeoff, I made sure to point the nose exactly into the wind, then slowly advanced the throttle all the way until finally the tail came up. Without the torpedo, the plane would have lifted off much earlier, but with all the extra weight, the ship seemed reluctant to leave the ground. Hmm, not much runway left out there, I said to myself. Just as I started to sweat, she lifted off and I started breathing again. The engine sound was also deeper, and I could feel it straining against the load. I made a gentle turn and started climbing out towards the target area. I watched the plane in front of me drop its torpedo with a splash. Then it was my turn. I started lining up on the target ship about 5,000 yards out and entered a gentle descent. Before long I was straight and level only 150 feet above the surface and closing fast on the float with its red flag that marked the release point. Of course there weren't going to be any buoys for the real thing, but it got us used to estimating the proper release distance of 300 yards. 100 yards from the buoy, I yelled into the speaking tube, prepare to release, then release, and the torpedo dropped away. Freed from the heavy load, the airplane immediately leapt upwards and the airspeed increased. Finally, I could relax. I saw the torpedo floating on the surface and headed back to base. Unlike the other flying we did, launching torpedoes is entirely up to the pilot, his skill alone determines success or failure. The next stage of our training was with torpedoes that would run under water. These torpedoes also used water to take the place of a warhead and were powered by compressed air engines. The compressed air was used to ignite oil, propelling the torpedo for a certain distance. The amount of water in the warhead was set so that they would float to the surface after their runs. Following the instructions of my section leader Masanaga, I hopped in my plane and headed for the target area. Today's ship would also be anchored, so if I missed it I would really lose face. To calm myself, I did some deep abdominal breathing, because the torpedo was released at an airspeed of 80 kts. When it hit the water it followed a curved path, first diving to a depth of 60 feet after release, and then recovering to its running depth of 25 feet and a speed of 42 kts. Very carefully I lined up on the target. When I was certain the plane was trimmed up and flying true, I dropped the torpedo, then watched its wake as it sped off towards the ship. It impacted dead centre, and a column of water shot up from the side of the ship a direct hit. With a huge sense of relief, I headed back to base, knowing that I had successfully passed the most important test. Thank you, torpedo, I thought. What I really wanted to do was yell out loud for joy. On the return flight, my heart felt as light as the airplane. After landing, I ran over to the command centre and reported my success to section leader Masanaga. The torpedo hit the target vessel dead centre, I said. He just smiled and nodded contentedly. Here is a description of the structure of our Type 91.2 torpedoes. The warhead is filled with 700 pounds of explosive that is detonated by a detonator when the torpedo hits the ship. A safety device prevents the detonator from arming until after the torpedo has travelled a certain distance underwater. The air tank is filled with compressed air at 150 to 200 atmospheres, which is used to ignite the fuel oil which drives the propeller. In addition to tanks for air and fuel oil, a depth meter measures water pressure and automatically adjusts the running depth of the torpedo. The engine room includes a stop, start mechanism and the engine. In the rear compartment are the propeller shaft, a tank for lubricating oil, fin adjusting mechanism, safety device and the gearing for the propeller drive. Overall length, 18 feet weight, 1700 pounds, diameter, 17.7, .7, speed, 42 kts. On March 16th, our final training exercise was held. We were to make a long distance round trip flight to Kagamigahara airfield in Shizuoka, a distance of 440 miles. Flight time would be about five hours. This flight marked the completion of our four months of advanced training. However, this flight, which should have been a cause for celebration, was marred by the disappearance of Airman Second Class Tsuju Tazaka and his crew on March 19th. The three had departed our field in good spirits,
but the plane went missing between the Sunosaki Lighthouse and Shimoda. The next group of planes flew the same route and returned, but the plane was still missing. Thinking they had made a forced landing somewhere, we contacted everyone we could think of, but no one had seen the plane. Did they ditch? In flight breakup, we were completely at a loss. Finally, three of our senior pilots took off in three aircraft to do a search over the coastline. The rest of us just sat around at the field, staring at the sky and praying for their safe delivery. We were all in something of a stupor, unable to work or talk, just counting the minutes. After an hour or so, the search planes returned to the field, having discovered nothing. The ground station informed us that they had lost radio contact with the plane shortly after its departure. Because a strong west wind blowing there were no fishing boats at sea that day. Still, if they had put it down on the water, something would be floating out there. Again, the search planes went out, only to return with no good news. Already we had lost our first classmate to the sky. Tazaka had done well in all his classes and was a skilled pilot. We couldn't imagine what might have happened to him. Perhaps he wasn't paying attention, or maybe he had done something stupid. Truly, we were in a constant life and death battle with the sky where even a moment of incaution could have fatal consequences. The death of our comrades was a huge reality check for us all. To ensure that their deaths would not be in vain, we resolved to polish our skills and to be ever vigilant in our flying. On March 29th and 30, we completed our final ground schooling and paperwork and became qualified torpedo pilots. After 14 long months of training, our first big step as pilots was now behind us. On April 28, 1938, I was assigned to the 12th Naval Air Group, then based near the Chinese capital of Nanking. Accompanying me was Warrant Officer 3rd Class Hiratsuka. Only the two of us were sent. Our squadron mates saw us off and we said our goodbyes to the Tatayama Air Group. Our first stop was Tokyo, where we changed trains for Shimonoseki. It felt very lonely to be going off to war. As the train pulled out of Tokyo Station, I found myself gazing longingly at the neon lights of Ginza and wondered if I would ever see them again. Never before had their glow seemed so poignant and meaningful. The trip to Shimonoseki took a number of days, and because we were both acutely aware that we might never see these sights again, we made a point of getting off at every stop and buying souvenirs and sampling the local foods. When the train pulled into Shizuoka Station in the middle of the night, we had rice with minced sea bream. At Hamamatsu Station, we ate broiled eel, and at Otsu, we had sailor's sushi. Everywhere we stopped, we made a point of eating and drinking our fill. When the train finally arrived at Sasebo, we were made provisional members of the Sasebo Naval Marine Squadron. One of the first people we met was Nishimoto, a former classmate from the Omura Air Group. It turned out the three of us would be going to China together. The first thing we did was look for ships leaving for Shanghai. Fortunately, there was freighter leaving that day at noon, so we got on board and a few hours later were passing through Genko Inada bound for China. However, it wasn't until we arrived in Shanghai that I began to realize that I was in fact in a war zone. We arranged passage on another freighter headed up the Yangtze River to Nanking and once again were on our way. Incredibly, it took the ship an entire week to make the trip to Nanking. I couldn't believe it. In my airplane, I could have made it in only three hours. It occurred to me that even in a war zone, some places were still pretty relaxed. Finally, on May 5th, we tied up at the wharf at Nanking. We had no sooner stepped off the ship than a Navy truck arrived, which took us across the city to Daikoiki Airfield, where we were formally inducted into the 12th Naval Air Group. The group consisted of 18 carrier fighters and 18 carrier bombers. Our mission was to support the combined Army and Navy advance up the Yellow River. The leader of my section was First Lieutenant Eiji Murata. Like most of the other pilots, he came from the Tatayama Air Group, so we all knew each other. This put my mind at ease and made me feel very much at home. When I went to the command centre to check in, I discovered that the other section leader was none other than First Lieutenant Tetsuo Kobayashi, my former section leader when I was a trainee. As soon as he saw us, he laughed and said, You three are the newest pilots here, so you have got to do our work too. This group was using the Type 96 carrier bomber, so our first day was devoted to training. After that, we went out on patrol flights. 
This consisted of flying 60 miles south of our base at Nanking and patrolling the area between Sanshan and Wanshi at an altitude of 15,000 feet for two hours at a time. If enemy planes launched an attack on our base at Nanking, we would radio a warning so we could wipe it out. The problem was we never knew if or when they would attack, so these patrols were quite stressful. Still, for new guys like us, it was our first chance to see China, and we enjoyed the spectacular views from our aerial vantage point. During our first few patrols, we were in a state of constant wonderment at the unusual scenery spread out before us. Unconsciously, I found myself singing the song of the mounted bandit about a highwayman from Japan who spent a life of solitude roaming across Manchuria. When I left my homeland, my skin was smooth as jade. Now it is scarred by bullet and knife. Only then did I begin to comprehend how big China really was. Looking down upon this vastness, the sentiment expressed by the line, cramped Japan is no place for me, was easy to understand. Even from this lofty perch, the endless plains seemed to stretch off to infinity. For 5,000 years, the yellow waters of the Yangtze had carved their way across these lands on their relentless journey to the sea. The waters of the bay reach the heavens as they flow 10,000 miles to the sea. Looking down, I could see that the road below us had ditches cut across it every 20 metres or so, an effort by the enemy to slow the progress of our troops. On the hills overlooking the road, the many bunkers built by the Chinese army gave mute testimony to the ferocity of their resistance. Gazing down upon the world like this induced a strange sense of detachment. The war and its consequences seemed so far away that I often wondered where or even if it was actually taking place. In this trance-like state, I was always surprised at how quickly the time passed. Before long, my replacement would show up, rock his wings, the spell would be broken, and I would begin a gentle descent towards our home field. For many days this was all I did. It was a very peaceful interlude that couldn't last. When the Joshua offensive began, the mood changed abruptly. Our base suddenly became very busy when a group of carrier planes joined us at our main base at Nanking. Shortly thereafter, a tragic case of friendly fire occurred when planes from this group mistakenly bombed our own troops, causing many casualties. The Chinese army was putting up very stiff resistance, and our troops were fighting desperately to break through their lines. They radioed for air support, and the recently arrived carrier planes sorted to assist them. When the flight leader arrived over the front, he saw a highway crammed with troops and vehicles. Before thoroughly scouting the battlefield to determine where the friendlies were, he immediately ordered his group to attack. What he didn't realise was that these were advancing Japanese troops who had finally broken through the Chinese lines. Even a casual observation would have revealed that these were our troops. When the troops first saw the rising sun symbols on the 18 planes, they broke out in cheers and waved to them. Then the bombs started raining down. Many were killed and wounded. This tragedy was a worst-case example of what happens when a flight leader makes a hasty decision. There was also inadequate communication with the commanders on the ground. Though I was never privy to the details of this incident, shortly after it occurred all the carrier planes returned to their ship, and our base returned to its usual peacefulness. In the end, in spite of this blunder, our troops eventually occupied Joshu and the Chinese army retreated further southward. Shortly thereafter, an order arrived from on high for us in the 12th Air Group to attack the retreating Chinese troops. I went over to the blackboard at the command centre and sure enough, there was my name right at the top. I was to be the second plane in the third section. My friend Nishimoto would fly the third plane. Our target was the city of Cochin, just south of Joshu. We were ordered to give air support to the troops attacking the city. I have to admit that I was quite happy to see my name on the blackboard for the first time. Impatiently, I wolfed down my breakfast. I was so excited to be going on my first combat mission that I could hardly sit still, and I found myself imagining all sorts of possible scenarios. After eating, I went to the field to help load the bombs. Each plane was carrying six 125 pounds bombs. At 125 pounds, each bomb was heavier than a bale of rice. It took all my strength to lift them up to their attach points. The flight consisted of nine carrier bombers supported by six carrier fighters. Before we took off, the navigators drew out our course on their maps. I strapped an eight-shot pistol to my side. 
lined up in front of the command centre and gave my crew some final instructions. Captain Mickey gave us our final orders and wished us luck. We then ran off to our respective airplanes and climbed in. After running up our engines and performing the pre-flight checks, we lined up behind our section leader and signalled that we were ready to go. When everyone was ready, we throttled up and began our takeoff roll. This was my first takeoff carrying a heavy bomb load. But I figured that it couldn't be much different than carrying the 1700 pounds torpedo, so I just flew the same way. We climbed out slowly, turning gently to stay in formation with the lead plane. After forming up over the field, we set course for Cochin. The six Type 96 fighters split up into two sections of three and positioned themselves on our right and left flanks. It felt good to have them watching over us. The distance to Cochin was about 130 miles, so it would take us about an hour and 20 minutes to arrive over the target. I was trying to remain calm, but probably because this was my first combat sortie, I was really nervous and I repeatedly found myself over-controlling the plane. I kept adjusting the throttle trying to stay behind the lead plane and was all over the place. Before long, Nishino, my backseater, was even yelling at me to settle down. Finally, I just pretended that my former instructor, Tanaka, was back there yelling at me, and to my surprise, I was soon flying along very smoothly. Looking off to the side, I could see that the number two ship of Nishimoto's was having similar problems maintaining position. Unlike the fighters, because the bombers were carrying heavy loads, repeated changes to engine RPM significantly increased fuel consumption. This could result in premature fuel exhaustion, with predictably severe consequences. After an otherwise uneventful flight, we arrived over the target area at an altitude of 3,000 feet. A few moments later, we were on our bombing run. The most important factor when formation bombing is to keep the airplane perfectly horizontal. If there is even the slightest up or down, or left or right movement, the bomb aiming will be inaccurate. And of course, the higher the altitude, the more difficult it is to hit the target. Below us, our troops seem to be having a tough time of it. We received word that house-to-house -house fighting was going on in one corner of the city. I was still really nervous, but I figured that if I just followed the lead plane's movements, I would be okay. Just then, the lead plane gave the signal and started releasing its bombs one at a time. My observer immediately did the same. The plane immediately felt much lighter. When the last bomb was away, the bombers began a right turn to egress the area. This being my first mission and all, I was still in somewhat of a daze. During our turn, I looked down at the ground and saw some bright flashes with smoke billowing up after them. Must be our guys shooting off their artillery, I thought to myself. There was neither anti-aircraft fire nor any sign of enemy fighters. Our task completed, we set course for home, now flying in a more relaxed formation. Hey, did you see those bright flashes? I said to Nishino. Our guys are really giving them hell. What are you talking about? Those were our bombs detonating made me feel like a real idiot. I didn't even recognise the explosions of the bombs I had just dropped. What a greenhorn. Still, I was surprised that even a 125 pounds bomb created quite an explosion. Unexpectedly, I found myself thinking of my mum and the family. What would they think if they could see me flying this plane? I really wanted to show them what I had accomplished. Before long, we arrived back at our base at Nanking, where all our planes landed without incident. The first thing I did was run over to operations and make my report. My chief feeling, though, was one of relief. Though I knew that I might someday fall from the sky, until that day I was determined to keep myself in good shape and fly without regrets. And it was with these thoughts that my first day of combat came to a close. These air support missions continued as our troops advanced up the Yangtze, until finally the Anqing offensive got underway. About ten miles up the Yangtze from Anqing, the Chinese had sunk six ships in an attempt to block the progress of our forces. We were ordered to go up there and take aerial photographs. Our flight of three planes was led by Lieutenant Maruyama. Before takeoff, he told us that, that when we got over the area, he would rock his wings. We were then to get into single file formation and fly over the river so our observers could take photos. We flew up there without incident. From above, it was easy to see the six masts of the ships sticking up out of the water on the left and right sides of the river. 
It seemed to me that this effort would have been more effective had they cut the masts off to make them flush with the water surface so they couldn't be seen. As it was, they were just advertising the fact that they had sunk some ships there. Anyway, Maruyama rocked his wings. We lined up behind him and began our photo runs at an altitude of 3,000 feet. On the hills to our right, we could see flashes of anti-aircraft fire as the Chinese blasted away at us with machine guns and cannons. My observer Hamanaka noted their positions on his map. In spite of all the flying I had done, this was my first baptism by fire. The flak and tracers going off around us looked like fireworks. Flying through the puffs of black smoke, I noticed that I was becoming very tense and that my bowels started feeling loose. I hate to admit it, but that was the truth later when talking with the senior pilots. They said that the stuff going off to the right and left of your flight path wasn't so bad but it was the ones going off straight ahead of you that you had to worry about. To a greenhorn like me, though, they all looked like they were headed straight for me, and it wasn't a good feeling. Finally, we finished with the photo work. Now it was our turn to dish it out. We got into a bombing formation, did a 180, and came back over the hill where the gun emplacements were. We held a tight formation and waited for Maruyama's signal to drop. I was still scared shitless, but I couldn't wait to get back at those bastards for shooting at us. On Maruyama's signal, we all released simultaneously and the bombs rained down, silencing the guns. As we cruised back down the Yangtze in loose formation at an altitude of 1,500 feet, I felt a huge sense of relief at having completed our task successfully. A few weeks later, Anking was occupied by our troops, and the 12th Squadron moved to a field on the outskirts of the city. Then, in mid-July, preparations for the battle to take Zhujiang began, Day after day we made two or three sorties to attack enemy positions. We were so busy we couldn't even see straight. When our troops ran up against particularly stiff opposition and wanted help, they would spread out a large cloth with an arrow on it pointing out the location of the enemy forces. We would then dump our bombs on the most likely looking enemy positions in front of the arrow. Also, when we were overhead, the enemy troops would take cover in their foxholes, making it easier for our guys to advance. For this reason, even after we had dropped our bombs, we would loiter in the area for a couple of hours. Then, as soon as we returned to base, we would rearm our planes, wash down a rice ball with a cup of tea, have a smoke and head out again. This went on for ten straight days. On July 24th, the main attack on Zhujiang got underway. The Chinese fought doggedly, but were eventually forced to retreat into the mountains of Lushan in the face of our intense air attacks and naval bombardment from our ships on the Yangtze. By that afternoon, the Japanese flag was proudly flying at the centre of the city. However, the price for our victory was very high. We later learned that everyone in the Izuka division below the rank of unit commander had been killed. The airfield at Jiujiang was located on high ground in the middle of a lake district and was surrounded on three sides by water. In an effort to slow our advance, the Chinese had cut the dikes in five places, flooding the airfield there. Our troops eventually repaired the damage, but it took them over a month and slowed our advance. On August 12th, a big air raid was carried out against Hankow. To assist in the attack, 27 medium bombers came in from the Takayoka Naval Air Base on Taiwan. Counting fighters and light bombers, more than 100 planes took part in the attack. We took off from Anqing and climbed out on course to an altitude of 15,000 feet, at which point we could look down on Wusan Sanqing. I was expecting plenty of resistance from enemy fighters and was looking forward to seeing our fighters knock them down. Of course, I had yet to even see an enemy airplane in the air, so I really had no idea what such an air battle would be like. I just thought it would be fun to watch. Our target for the day was the railroad marshalling yard at Wuchang, on the outskirts of Wusan. The purpose was to cut the enemy's supply lines. It sounds funny but it was like one of those early autumn days in Japan with not a cloud in the sky, a perfect day for bombing. On the signal from flight leader Murata, the nine plans in our formation released their bombs simultaneously. Bright flashes marked the spots where the 54 bombs impacted the target, followed by enormous plumes of smoke and dirt. For some reason there was no anti-aircraft fire at all, maybe because there are enemy fighters nearby, I thought but I looked all around and couldn't see any. I was actually a bit disappointed because I was hoping to at least see some. 
As we turned out over the Yangtze and set course for home, the anti-aircraft fire finally came up to greet us. Looking down, I could see the muzzle flashes from the guns. There seemed to be five or six gun emplacements down there. If I'd only had some bombs left, I could have returned their friendly greeting in Keend. Their shells were going off all around us, but for some reason, I wasn't the least bit afraid. All our planes returned safely to Anking. In early September, our unit transitioned from the Type 96 carrier attack bomber to the Type 97 carrier attack bomber. In order to get checked out in the new planes, we all returned to Peking for a week. The planes looked absolutely stunning, featuring modern lines and retractable landing gear. The Type 97 was the latest offering from the Nakajima Airplane Company. We were thrilled to be getting such a hot ship. The Type 97 was a three-seater, pilot, observer, radio man powered by a Sakai 11 radial engine producing 1,000 horsepower. Cruise speed was 130 kts and top speed was 204 kts at 11,000 feet. Range was 1,075 miles. Fuel capacity 260 gallons and it carried a bomb load of six 125-pound bombs and two 250-pound bombs, one 1,600-pounds bomb or one torpedo. After arriving in Peking, we spent two days in ground school, followed by three days of flight training. This was the Navy's only carrier-based attack plane with retractable landing gear, and we were all excited to be one of the first frontline units to get it. Training over, we returned to our base at Anking looking forward to getting into action in our new ships. We didn't have long to wait. On September 10th, we were ordered to attack Chinese positions about 20 miles up the Jujiang River. The nine planes of our unit were loaded up with six 125 pounds bombs each, and we took off looking for a fight. Compared with the Type 96, which was a biplane with a cruising speed of 80 knots, the Type 97 was a monoplane that cruised at 130 knots. That 50-knot difference meant that we were over our target area after only 30 minutes. Looking down, I could see our destroyers and minesweepers clearing the harbour on the Yangtze. I felt sorry for all those sailors jammed like sardines in those tin cans, while here we were flying around free as the birds. I wish them well. The Yangtze was very narrow at this point. The Chinese were dug in on the hilly terrain on the river's banks and were holding up our troops. The area around their positions was interlaced with trenches. For about 20 minutes, we circled overhead, observing their positions. Then we dove to attack. We were only seconds from bombs away when my plane's engine threw out a big puff of white smoke and stopped running, leaving the propeller to windmill ineffectively. Crap. This was not good. Fortunately, we were still at about 3,000 feet, so I lowered the nose to keep us from stalling. The first thing I did was check the fuel cock. No trouble there. That could only mean an engine failure, which meant that a crash landing was our only option. Unfortunately, we were over enemy territory, so the only thing I could think of was to crash, dive the plane into an enemy position. So, this is the end for me, I muttered to myself. By this time we had fallen far behind the other planes. Fortunately our bombs were still with us, so we could do a lot of damage when we hit. My observer was my good buddy from flight school, Matsumoto. Hey Matsumoto, I yelled casually into the voice tube. The engine blew so I'm going to crash us into the bad guys. His reply was surprisingly unemotional. That's okay with me. Do it, damn. He's really got some balls, I thought or maybe he's just putting on a good face. Either way, he's all right. The other planes were now making their runs, and there was no point in trying to signal them. They had enough to worry about. As if all this wasn't enough, our radio was also out. Saito, my radio man just kept signalling no good, no good. The altimeter was rapidly unwinding, and before long we were down to 1,200 feet. I took one fond last look at the sky. The rest of the group had completed their bombing runs and were climbing out to the right and heading home. I was holding the stick in my right hand and looking for a good place to crash into. When we reached 900 feet, I spotted an anti-aircraft emplacement and figured that would be as good a place as any to end it all. Leaning back towards Matsumoto, I yelled out, 
Sayonara, everyone. But through it all, my left hand had been unconsciously operating the manual fuel pump. We had been trained to use the manual pump when switching tanks to prevent the fuel pressure from dropping. So, without really thinking about it, I had been pumping away on it absent-mindedly. Suddenly, the engine threw out a puff of smoke, sputtered to life, and then stopped again. I kept pumping, and it started up again. Hey, Matsumoto, I got the engine running. Dump those bombs, you got it. With the bombs gone, the plane could just maintain level flight. Far off to the right, I could see our destroyers in the Yangtze River. If we could only make it that far, just then, the enemy opened up on us, and tracers began flying past on both sides. Shit, now we're going to get shot down. Looks like the three of us are just not meant to make it out of this one. We managed to avoid getting hit, but the engine was barely running. It would run for a minute or so, then stop. Smoke and oil were pouring out of it. I kept pumping away. We couldn't gain any altitude, but we were flying. It had only been about two minutes since the engine first died, but it seemed like forever. Finally, we made it over our ships, and I figured I had put us down in the water next to them. We would lose the plane, but at least our lives would be saved. Still, I wasn't too thrilled about ditching, and so decided to try for home. If the crate would stay in the air for another five minutes, we could probably make it. Matsumoto, I am going to try and make it back to base. You're driving, said Matsumoto in full Kansai dialect. I had to laugh at how cool he was under fire. I told Saito to try and get through, but the radio was still on the fritz. Everyone was probably starting to worry about us by now. We continued sputtering along, slowly losing altitude. Just when we got to 150 feet, an army airfield appeared below us, and I headed straight in for a landing and set her down. I had just pulled off the runway when the engine quit for good. Silence. With the release in tension, I was overcome with exhaustion. Leaning forward onto the instrument panel, I closed my eyes and tried to regain my composure. A car drove out to pick us up and take us to the operations centre. The command post was a local home with a dirt floor and only a desk for furniture. A grey-haired army major came over to the three of us, laughed and said, What happened? Have a bit of engine trouble. He was such an easy-going guy that I felt like I was talking with an old friend. Can you contact our base for us? Our timing is perfect, said the major. We have got a transport plane leaving for Peking in a few minutes. He will fly over your field and drop a message canister. We wrote up a note telling of our predicament and asked them to send a mechanic to fix the engine. The transport took off for Peking a few minutes later. We figured someone would be coming for us soon, so we lounged around on the grass, smoked cigarettes, and talked about our narrow escape. By nightfall we had still received no word from our base, so we resigned ourselves to being guests of the army for the night. Don't worry about it, you can stay with us, said Greyhair. An orderly took us to the barracks, fixed us up with some beds and brought us dinner. By this time, we were ravenous and we arted like starving men. No sooner had we finished than a lieutenant came in, sorry about the Lucy food. It's the best we can do out here in the sticks, but how about some beer to celebrate your survival? I don't remember much about the rest of the evening, but early the next morning a plane arrived with a couple of mechanics and a box of parts. Turned out that the piston in the number six cylinder had melted. They replaced the cylinder and piston, and before long we were all safely back at Anking. Even today I can still taste that first swig of cold beer at that army airfield in the Chinese countryside. When the army had finally repaired the flood damage to Jiujiang airfield, we packed our bags again and it became our new home. As I mentioned before, this airfield was surrounded on three sides by lakes that were at higher elevation than the airfield. When taking off and landing, we had to be careful not to hit the levees with our landing gear. Worse still, the lakes were bordered on the far shore by the Lushan Mountains. During the three months after our forces occupied Jiujiang, the enemy had established bases in the mountains and was launching attacks on our lines. However, because our troops had sealed off the area around the mountains, the Chinese troops were running out of food and supplies. 
This caused the enemy to launch occasional foraging incursions to the areas around our field in search of provisions, so we could never let our guard down. An army unit was stationed on our field to protect us, and they repelled these attacks, but the Chinese were tough and resilient fighters. After the field had completely dried out, a crew came in and built permanent quarters for us. For us, bomber crews, the daily grind continued without let-up. By this time I was pretty comfortable flying the new plane, but because it was still so new and so much more complex than the Type 96, the mechanics were not completely up to speed on working on it, so we suffered frequent mechanical problems. To help keep the planes in the air, there were days when we all stood down and everyone pitched in to work on them. It was around this time, during the Nanchang Offensive, that we received word that a supply convoy carrying food and ammunition to our troops was surrounded by a large enemy force and annihilated. The troops for whom the supplies were destined were then cut off and isolated. Their location was only 60 miles from our base at Jiujiang, so we were ordered to give them air support. We had to fly three missions a day, but because we were out in the sticks, we had no central ammo dump. This meant that all the bombs were stacked up in the grass at various places around the field. So as soon as we returned from one mission, we had to immediately run around the field, pick up the 54 125 pounds bombs for the next mission, carry them to the planes and get ready to head out again. Talk about hard labour. This was a job for sumo wrestlers, not pilots. To make matters worse, the grass around the field was infested with snakes. Every time we picked up a bomb, two or three snakes would slither out from underneath it. At first, this scared the hell out of us, but it wasn't long before some of the more enterprising among us killed a bunch of them. They put them on skewers, and that evening we had a big snake roast. They tasted great with a little soy sauce. After two days of air support, the cut-off forward unit was finally reached by our troops and we returned to our usual bombing missions along the Yangtze. On October 29th, our forces occupied Hankou, and on November 6th, the 12th Air Group relocated to Hankou Airfield. However, when we arrived, we were puzzled to see small red flags sticking up from the ground at various locations around the runway. When we asked the base security guys about this, they told us the flags indicated the locations of minefields, and for us to stay away from them. It turned out that the warning flags had been planted by the Chinese, but that our troops had advanced so quickly they didn't have time to remove them. We were all very thankful that we hadn't discovered the mines on our own. We were quartered in some sort of former research facility near Hankou. We never figured out exactly what sort of research went on there, but the rooms were separated by steel grating. With five or six of us sleeping in each room, we often felt that we'd been thrown in prison for crimes we hadn't committed. It was not a pleasant place. Not that our minor privations were of any consequence in the grand scheme of things. Since the Marco Polo Bridge incident, our forces had taken Shanghai, moved rapidly up the Yangtze River, and now occupied Hankou. After this rapid advancement, I expected our troops to take a break, so I was astonished to learn that they were continuing their push into China's interior. I really thought our generals had lost their minds. But of course, no one was interested in the opinions of a lowly pilot. Like everyone else, my duty was simply to follow orders. Still, China was such a vast country that I couldn't help wondering how far we would have to advance before our generals would be satisfied. I really thought they had lost their minds. Meanwhile. Our bombing missions against enemy positions along the Yangtze continued as usual. Before long, the plans of our generals became clear. 